Sweet. Y'all ready to get into the Word? Man, somebody's excited. Has this series been good so far about powerful relationships? So we've been talking for the last two weeks about having what we call powerful relationships. I subtitled the series, The Game Plan for Winning Relationships. And the first week I taught you what it means to be powerful people, that powerful people are people that have self-control. It's one of the, part of the fruit of the Spirit. The last one that we tend to ignore is self-control, that I'm in control of me, I bring all of me to my relationships, but I expect you to do the same. And then last week, we talked about fear and love, how fear and love are like oil and water, and that no matter what you do, they don't ever mix. That fear drives love out, but love drives fear out, that pain makes a bad teacher, and pain leads to fear, and fear just isn't welcome in our relationships. And so we've been, every week we start with Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So powerful people are people who have control of themselves. Remember, we don't get to control our circumstances or other people as much as that would probably make life easier if we could. Um, (laughs) But we don't get to. But we always have a choice on how we're going to respond to somebody. Ten out of ten times. And we we talked in the first week about reacting versus responding. And that if you're someone who's got a short fuse between your reaction and your response, that you need to learn how to pause and step away for a minute so that you don't respond out of a reaction. You don't take time to process it and take every thought captive, right? And so... Today, I want to talk about what happens if we let fear stick around in our relationships. And then I'll give you a little bit of a foreshadowing. Next week, we're talking about setting boundaries and limits with people. So that's, so this is the next two today and next week are very practical. Like you should walk out with some tools that you can start using in your relationships. Um, the first two weeks are more kind of uh, theory. Um, it all sounds good, but then you got to put you know, rubber to the road with how, how you do these. And so repeated pain can cause long-term damage. If you've ever dealt with or know someone who's dealt with chronic pain or a chronic illness, nobody in this room, kidding, yeah. but eventually the original pain isn't even the problem anymore. The chronic nature of the pain becomes the problem. We become, in, in, a, in a medical sense, if you've ever known someone who's dealt with actual like, chronic physical pain, eventually we develop tolerances to the pain medication, and they've got to find new ways to treat the pain. And they've, like, they've done studies that it's actually the original pain can have gone. But we develop, our brains just do this. Over time, we develop this chronic nature to our pain where the medications don't even work anymore. And they've got to continue to crank up the medications to try to treat this chronic thing. But it all started with some kind of injury to begin with, some kind of original pain. And it's the same thing in our relationships. We develop defense mechanisms over time And the more we develop these and strengthen these walls that we build around ourselves, the more we we build this fortress, the further disconnected we get from the original injury. So then we're defending these, like it's like we build like a castle with like a moat with alligators and stuff in it, right? At least mine would have alligators in it, probably sharks too, and with laser beams on their heads. Um, Dr. Evil, anybody? Um, So anyway... uh, (laughs) We, we build these, these fortresses around ourselves to protect ourselves from pain, and eventually what caused the pain isn't even the problem anymore. The problem is we have to then maintain this structure around ourselves that we've built, and we're not even really, we've, not really because it's subconsciously there, but we've forgotten about the original pain. And we're just maintaining this defense structure that we built. And so the title of the message today is Take Off the Mask. 
And this is not a medical message, but you should take that one off too. All right, let's pray. Lord, help us take off our masks. Amen. All right. So have you guys ever seen the movie The Mask? Yeah. 1994. I've just been, it's been like an old school movie series this time. I don't know. All my illustrations come from early 90s movies the last couple of weeks. But when I was thinking about this message, I thought about that movie. And in the beginning of the movie, Jim Carrey plays this character. He's, I think he's a lawyer. And um, he's got like a real jacked up life. Like he hates his life. Nothing goes right. He gets thrown out of clubs, can't get into the parties, like all of that. And he finds this mask and he puts this mask on and it's I actually found out in doing a little bit of reading that it's actually supposedly the mask in the movie The Mask is actually um, gets its power from the Norse god Loki. Anyway, didn't know that until like yesterday. Um, but anyway, um, this mask literally transforms him into someone else. It's eccentric, outgoing, um, good with the ladies, you know, everyone likes him. He can smooth talker, manipulative kind of person. Um, but ultimately, the mask is his undoing. Like it ends up ruining his life. Um, and then at the very end of the movie, like throw it in the river and the dog gets it. And I had to watch like a little 10 minute recap of the movie last night because I had forgotten some of the details. But anyway, I want us to just kind of keep that image in our mind as we go through this this morning. So point number one, masks are a disguise. Like I know y'all came for some real profound preaching this morning, I know. Um, so, <laughs> but think about it. Like on Halloween, when we dress up, when I was a kid, um, my, my papa, my, my mom's dad, um, he would like decorate the outside of their house, like all like scary, but like they had this little, like, it's like a kind of a porch, but it went like opposite of what a porch would go. But it's kind of, so we would like take in, like that like fake spider web and put it all up and then hang black lights and like make it all like creepy to get up to the front door. And then I would dress up like an all black wearing like a scary mask and like hide around the corner of the house. And then when little kids would come up and get their candy, I would like sneak out and be like, Rah! and then they would like take off running and, and freaked out. But wearing that mask made me feel powerful because <laughs> I could scare some little kids. <laughs> and so I just, I wonder how much we do that in our relationships. So, again, super profound preaching this morning, I know. But the definition of the word mask is just a covering of the face or a disguise. But I like the verb definition better for the word mask. It means to conceal something from view. To disguise or hide something. So masks are great for Halloween when we want to pretend to be someone else. But they make really bad relational hiding places. We hit on this last week, but the very first time sin entered the world, the very first thing Adam and Eve did was hide. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, there's fear, because I was naked, so I hid. He masked himself off from the Lord. So here's what that looks like in relationship. Somewhere along the way, something bad happens. Trust gets broken, we get hurt, whatever. Happens over and over again. I feel out of control because I can't control the other person. They keep hurting me and I can't control that. And so it creates anxiety. And somehow we don't like to call it that, but it's what it is. You call a spade a spade. It creates anxiety. Anytime you feel out of control, the root behind that is anxiety. And then we develop these fear-based responses. I told you about a couple weeks ago, um, fight, flight, and freeze. So I'm going to stand firm against the threat, and I'm going to fight it. 
I'm going to flight, I'm going to run away from it. Freeze, I'm just going to like unable to move and just hope that it goes away like they tell you with a bear. Like just like don't move, play dead. And there's actually a fourth one we didn't hit on a couple weeks ago, but there's a fourth one called fawn. And fawning is when you um, try to please the other person to get the, get the scary thing to go away. Like, I'll give you whatever you want. All those are bad. Eventually, the tree of knowledge starts talking to us a little bit, and we come up with this genius plan. We just say, well, hey, you know what? I'll just put a mask on and not let anyone really see what's going on inside me. Then when someone says, well, how are you doing today? Well, I'm just good, brother. I'm blessed and highly favored. But it's a lie. We think we're protecting ourselves, but that's actually the deception. We're created for intimacy. And when people can't see who you really are, they're actually relating to the facade that you've created. If you build that moat that we talked about, that castle, and you don't let anyone come inside the castle, they can only relate with the thing that you present to them. And so we build this entire false reality around us, and then interactions, people interact with the mask that we're wearing And then we find ourselves divided internally between this face, this mask that we have to put on for everyone else, and what's really going on inside us that nobody gets to see. Everyone gets to see our Facebook post and our Instagram post about how awesome everything is. And then we cry ourselves to sleep because we've got issues with our loved ones. And we don't let anyone see that. I saw a video this week from Tim Ross, and he said, who you are when no one is around is who you really are. You can put on a mask and show everyone some other version of yourself, but it's not true. It's a lie. The Bible talks about it this way in James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I misquote. This was James 3 this morning. It's James 1. Um, it's James 1, verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, here it is, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He expects intimacy from us. He expects us to be real with him. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Ultimately, this passage is talking about faith, but I think it applies in just about every area of our life. Verse 8 says, a double-minded person is unstable in everything they do. You can't live a reality with a mask on where people are relating to that and then have this inner turmoil that nobody gets to see. That's being double-minded. You're literally living two different lives. You have a mask on and you put on this face to show everyone else. I'm not saying that you need to just like be like all the time to everybody, but you should probably talk to somebody. Go get some counseling, get some freedom ministry, some inner healing, Because the longer we wear that mask, the more damage it's going to cause because people can't relate to the real you. And what that really creates inside us is isolation. And just look at the last couple of years what isolation does to people. You don't need me to tell you what isolation does to people. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Part of self-control is taking control of ourself and renewing our mind. 
That's literally the word for repent, metanoia in Greek. He says, renew your mind. Change the way we think about it. I heard somebody say one time, I believe in gun control. I've got a gun, and if you try to hurt my family, I will control you with it. (laughs) We have to do that with our flesh sometimes. Like, we have to go to our flesh and say, like, you're going to... There's a song we sing, um, uh, Gratitude, where where you're literally having to talk to your soul. Come on, my soul. Like, don't you get shy on me. You've got a line. You have to remind yourself that. Sometimes it takes taking control of that by force. When we build up a a facade, we've given control over to fear. And so we need to take back that control. And the good news is the Holy Spirit will help you do it. So point number one Masks are disguised as point number two. Masks hijack communication. Like, I can't tell you how many times I had trouble hearing what somebody was saying because I couldn't see their mouth moving over the last couple of years, right? So if we live in this dualistic reality where no one can see the real us, what's really driving that is fear of the truth. Have you ever been afraid of the truth? It wasn't even in my notes, but I thought about this morning. I was like, you want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Um, (laughs) But we've all had something at some point that we've been afraid of admitting the truth of. Maybe we screwed up at something and we didn't want to admit that we had done it. Um, Our budget, we don't want to admit that we don't have as much money as we think we do, that we're overspending. Um, A medical issue, like, well, I don't need to go to the doctor, I'm fine. Relational problems. And we can pretend the truth doesn't exist, but that doesn't make it go away. Denial ain't just a river in Africa, y'all. The Bible says, do not be afraid more frequently than any other command in the Bible. They're not all, like, legit do not be afraid, but there's 365 of them. Um, some of them, I, taught, I talked about it a few months ago. Go back and catch that. But do not be afraid is one of the most common commands in the Bible. Isaiah 41 verse 10 is one of them. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Just like in the movie, The Mask, When we put on a relational mask, it hijacks our relationships. When Jim Carrey puts on that mask in the movie, like when he takes it off, he doesn't have an awareness of what he had done. Like in the very first time he puts it on, and he goes, I think robs a bank or something the first time, and he like wakes up and he's like, has he's like, I had this really crazy dream that I robbed a bank last night, and then the cops like show up at his house and they're like, hey, uh, you know, you're a suspect in a bank robbery. Um, But it's the same thing when we put on a relational mask that the mask then hijacks our communication with other people. And just like the three fear-based responses of powerless people, there are fear-based communication styles. And so I'm going to give you those this morning. Number one, powerless people can be passive, passive communicators. The core belief of a passive communicator is you matter, your feelings matter, and I don't or mine don't. And they insist, they will insist, they'll actually, they'll actually say it, like they'll insist that your opinions or the other person's opinions matter more than theirs do. They'll say things like, well, that's okay, whatever you want to do, I'm fine. I know you were just upset. But the truth is, I'm afraid of what you'll do if I express my needs. I'm afraid of what you'll say if I tell you that what you did hurt me. Passivity is a self protection and it's dangerous. Um, Danny Silk gives all three of these communication types an animal um, to represent them. This one's the goat. It'll make sense in a minute. (laughs) 
but they're just, y'all ever seen a goat? They're stupid. <laughs> like, they're just, like, they just, just things just happen to goats. Like, if you've ever been around, my favorite are fainting goats. Yeah. Oh my God, I want a fainting goat so bad. I need one in my backyard that I can just go out and clap, and they just, like, freeze and fall over, and then they just get back up and run around. Y'all never seen fainting goats? Go Google it. It's awesome. All right, so (laughs) powerless people can be passive. Number two, powerless people can be aggressive. These are our rattlesnakes. They're loud and scary ones. The core belief of an aggressive powerless person is I matter and you don't. So the passive person is you matter and I don't. The aggressive person is, I matter and you don't. And wouldn't you know, they tend to find each other. Like, almost like clockwork, y'all. Like, if you find, almost always, you find a real passive person, they're almost always paired with an aggressive person. The aggressive person gets their way by taking what they want, usually from a passive person. Because the passive person will willingly give over control of themselves to an aggressive person. Both of those are powerless responses. They're, neither one of them are healthy. The aggressive person is also motivated by fear and selfishness. The truth of a powerless, aggressive person is that you won't do what I want you to do unless I make you do it. That's what's really behind that. They're worried that in their, you won't be faithful to me unless I make you be faithful to me in a romantic relationship. You won't do the job that I've asked you to do unless I micromanage every detail of what you do. That's an aggressive person. That person's our T Rex. Y'all ever seen Jurassic Park? What happens with a T-Rex and a goat? (laughs) The third thing, powerless people can be passive aggressive. This one is sneaky. Like the dude from Mr. Deeds. Very sneaky, sir. (laughs) Told y'all. This is just a 90s series. But passive aggressiveness is actually the most devious and dangerous of the three. The core belief of a passive aggressive person is you matter. Just kidding. No, you don't. They act through manipulation and control, and they use manipulation and control through deceit and punishment. The problem is, it's usually only visible to the person being controlled. They're good. They're wearing a mask for everyone else to see, but the person that they're controlling gets to see them without the mask on. And then they make the person they're controlling, usually a passive person, because the aggressive person would just fight. But they, the person they're controlling, they make that person look crazy because no one else sees the manipulation and the control happening. Everyone else sees the bubbly, happy person that usually very likable. That the controlled person sees the monster behind the mask. This is my favorite animal. Danny Silk calls this one a chocolate-covered dragon. They're charming and sweet on the outside, but they're vicious manipulators on the inside. The problem is you don't see the viciousness until you've already gotten past the chocolate. So we've got our passive people, we've got our aggressive people, and we've got our passive-aggressive people. 
So what about powerful people? How do they communicate? Powerful people are assertive communicators. What'd you say? <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt walks softly and carry a big stick. The core belief of an assertive, powerful person is you matter and so do I. The core value is honor and mutual respect. They're not afraid of what's going on inside themselves. They're willing to confront the mess inside themselves and deal with it. They're also not afraid of the mess inside someone else, but they don't take ownership of someone else's mess. They empower them to take care of their own, their own mess. They insist that the other people they're in relationship with be powerful. Remember, powerful people, they own, their, they take responsibility for themselves, they have self-control, and a powerful person will require that the people they're in relationship with are also powerful. They value the other person, and they'll take time to understand the other person. They refuse the temptation to become the goat, the T-Rex, or the chocolate dragon. That doesn't mean there's not a temptation to become those things. It just means that when they're tempted to be the goat, they don't become the goat. When they're tempted to be aggressive, they know they need to press pause and step away for a minute. And if the other person becomes the goat, the T-Rex, or the chocolate dragon, they'll confront that person. And if that person won't respond accordingly, then they'll set limits or boundaries to protect themselves and their relationship. The goal in communication should be understanding, not agreement. I don't have to agree with you to seek to understand your point of view. Agreement's awesome. Don't get me wrong. It's great. I would much rather agree than disagree. But I'll pursue understanding over agreement 10 out of 10 times. It's a big issue in our culture right now. Things like politics and religion have always been divisive. But man, over the last 10 years, we find out that someone has a different belief than we do, and we're done. We're shut down before we ever start. Not me. I have pretty... um, Typical evangelical Christian worldview beliefs. (laughs) But I also want to understand why someone else believes the way they do. I don't have to agree with it. In fact, I can staunchly disagree with it. But I can be friends with someone I don't agree with. But the flip side of that is they start getting nasty, I'm out. I'm not doing that. I don't do Facebook comment session debates. By the way, neither does our church. If you're listening to this and you watch our ad and you send us nasty messages on Facebook, we're just not going to engage. I'm going to hide your message so no one else can see it either. Love you. Um, <laughs> I've had about a dozen people's comments that come on our page and like want to start a. They like I can. I usually te- we have a group that like moderates our Facebook page and I text them or at least Brandy whenever we get one of those and I'm like, here we go again. Because I can tell with their first message what the third one's going to be. Because they don't ever come out with it right on the first message. They have they like, do you guys believe this? And I'm like, oh, God, here we go again. All right, cool. Get ready to mute. <laughs> that mute button's great on Facebook, y'all. So we may not agree, but most people who know me know that I would kill an issue before I'll kill a relationship. We just won't talk about it. If it's that big of a deal to you that we can't have a discussion about it, like we just won't talk about those things. So, 
Point number one, masks are disguises. Point number two, they hijack communication. And point number three, masks destroy connection. True connection requires vulnerability. The definition of the word vulnerability is capable of being physically or emotionally wounded. If you're, this is strong and I mean it, if you're in a relationship and you're not willing to be hurt by the other person, you're in a fake relationship. Relationships require vulnerability. The flip side of that is they also require trust. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I'll come back to that in a second. But the very best example in the Bible of vulnerability is actually Jesus himself. On the night he was betrayed in the garden, he took his three best friends with him, And he confided in them. And then he confided to the Father. This is what he said in Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Then he took Peter, James, and John. That's the two sons of Zebedee. He took Peter, James, and John, his homies that had gone on the Mount of Transfiguration, those were, those were his inner circle. We're going to talk about levels of intimacy about the people who get to be closest to you next week. So those are, those are his three closest friends on earth. So he pulled them aside and began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said, this is Jesus, y'all, Jesus. Then he says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said, I'm so sad I could die. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell to his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Vulnerability requires trust. Trust is a firm belief in the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. In other words, trust is my assessment of how safe you are. Your character, your ability, your strength, your truth. There are plenty of good-meaning, well-intentioned people that, I say I, but you can't have relationship with because they aren't able to coexist in a healthy relationship. Trust is foundational to connection. I can't have a relationship with somebody that I don't trust at least not without some boundaries. If you're familiar with the story, um, Jesus goes and he prays and they fall asleep. And he comes back and he's upset. It's okay to be upset sometimes. He says, you guys couldn't even stay awake for an hour? Try again. And he goes back and he prays again. He comes back and they're asleep again. And he's like, forget it. I'm going to go pray, do whatever you're going to do. But you can't have a relationship without without trust. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust is foundational to our relationship with God. And trust is a cycle. If you've ever thought about it, there's four steps to the trust cycle. Step one, I have a need. So the the powerless person gets to the point eventually where they just don't even, I don't even even have any needs anymore. I'm just, just whatever you say. Number two, I'll express that need. 
Number three, there's a response to the need. And then number four, the need is satisfied and it results in comfort, trust, and connection. Just like there's a trust cycle, there's also a mistrust cycle. They start in the same place, I have a need. And then I express the need. And then number three is where it goes wrong. There's either no response to the need or there's a bad response to the need that I express. The result is that the need I express remains unmet and it produces pain, fear, and disconnection. And this starts at infancy. That's why it's so important for a mother to bond with her child when they're an infant. Think about it. This is the cycle. I have a need. What do babies do when they have a need? Doesn't matter what the need is. They have, this, they have one way of expressing it. They cry. They could be happy. They could be hungry. They could, be, they could have a dirty diaper. Whatever it is, they cry. And that's, I have a need. Help me with it. That's declaring the need and expressing it. And then how we respond to that will either build trust in them and connection and a bond between the mother and the child or the father and the child or whoever's taking care of the child. That's why you got to be careful who you let your small children around. Um, Matthew verse 18, verse 6, chapter 18, verse 6 says this, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a huge millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. If you want to know what what God thinks about people who mess with kids, you can hit the pad. Okay. The trust cycle can be broken at any point. And broken trust leads to pain. If unhealed, especially over time, that can lead to us agreeing with lies. Things like, well, God doesn't love me. No one loves me. There's something wrong with me. I'm unworthy of love. I don't deserve to have my needs met. I know people who are like that. Agreement with these lies actually creates an expectation for unmet needs. Then we get into things like self-sabotage. We'll just destroy a relationship before we can even be hurt because we just assume we're going to get hurt again. The lie is that when we do that, we're basically hurting ourselves by not even expressing our need. We're breaking our own trust cycle. We've gotten, instead of like waiting to see if someone's going to respond, we just don't even express that we have needs. One bad experience, one empowered lie can lead to significant relational handicaps in your life. That's why going through freedom ministry and inner healing is so important. You've got to heal those things, especially the stuff from your childhood. The cycle of mistrust creates a painful reality where people feel hopeless about ever having their needs met because they're unable to trust others and form strong connections. So what do we do with all of this? I gave you a whole bunch of cycles and types of communication and all of that. I told you that masks are a facade, they're fake. They hijack communication and destroy connection. So what do we do? We have to become powerful people who are comfortable expressing our needs. We have to renounce lies that we've believed about ourselves and see ourselves how God sees us. That's the only way we can be powerful in relationship. If you can't even take your mask off with God, how are you going to take it off with other people? So here's the accountability part. So I've gotten a lot of questions and looks over the last couple of weeks as we've been going through this. 
about how being powerful almost seems like being a pushover. You're supposed to just sit back and take it. Keep your love on. Bring your love and just whatever they do, they do. Que sera, sera type thing. But there's a catch. Remember, my responsibility in relationship is that you will never have to worry about my half of our relationship. But you've got a responsibility to you. Reciprocity. I should never have to worry about your half of our relationship. We should both commit to meeting the needs of each other. And so when I express a need in a relationship, I expect, and it's your responsibility to meet that need. So here's how we do that. This is very practical. We use I statements. So you talk to somebody and it's, I feel, insert emotion here, when you action. What you can't do is put the word like in there. You can't say, I feel like you're a jerk. That's an opinion and that's not what we're doing. You've then transferred what you're talking about to the other person. That's not what it is. All I can do is tell you how your actions and your decisions have affected me and then ask you to change the way you're acting. What I've done in that is given you the power to be powerful or not. If I come to you and say, I feel upset when you say that I'm a dummy. And you go, well, then quit being dumb. There's only one acceptable response to that. I'm so sorry that I made you feel dumb. What can I do to never make you feel that way ever again? Anything other than that is a powerless response. So it's, I feel upset when you call me a dummy I need to feel like you've got my back. I need to feel like you don't think I'm an idiot in everything that I do. Can you do that? And when we give the other person the opportunity to respond, the way they respond, what they say is going to tell you everything you need to know about that person. When I enable someone else to be powerful, what I'm really doing is asking them, are you willing to be vulnerable enough to adjust your behavior to meet my needs? Because if we're in relationship, my needs are important and so are yours. But if my needs aren't important to you, you don't get to be this close to me. So here's what happens, and here's how you can tell what kind of person you're dealing with. When you express a need and they respond, the passive person will take ownership of whatever the problem is. Sure, whatever you want, I'm so sorry, like that. The aggressive person is going to either deflect or shift the blame or punch right back. Like, I feel upset when you, when you say I'm a dummy. Like, well, let me tell you all the things that you did to me. That's the aggressive person. What they're really saying is they're not willing to be vulnerable enough to admit that they've hurt you. You can't be in a relationship with somebody like that. At least not healthily. Yeah, I guess you physically can, but you shouldn't. The passive aggressive person will deflect and manipulate. They'll say, Don't be so dramatic. I didn't mean it like that. It's 
not that big of a deal. It is that big of a deal. If I'm telling you that what you've done has caused me pain and you shrug it off, that's a huge deal and a red flag and I can't be in a relationship with you until you own it. Here's what a powerful person does. They own their mistakes and they commit to pursue per- connection. I said it a second ago, but the, the only acceptable response is, I'm so sorry I made you feel that way. What can I do to adjust so that you never have to feel that way ever again? So next week, we're going to talk about what you do when the other person doesn't respond powerfully. It'll be the last message of this series. And so um, we've kind of been building up to that. And I hope that this has helped you like get some tools and framework. You're going to start seeing this and other people don't like go out and be like, you're powerless. Like, that's not like, <laughs> that's bad. Don't do that. That's not healthy. That's not, you're not going to win friends and influence people that way at all. Um, but I'll teach you next week how to go about setting healthy boundaries. And the goal with any boundary that you set is not to cut somebody off ever. That's never the goal. The goal of setting boundaries, the goal of that is always to protect the relationship. It's that if we keep going the way that we're going, this is going to end poorly. And so I've got to protect myself for whatever you, we'll get into it. But you have to, you have to set your boundary until the relationship can be restored. And when that's happened, when I've done that in my life, it has been amazing what the Lord can do. You can leave that going, Matt. Don't don't tell that. Um, Yeah, so today was our part about being powerful, becoming powerful, kicking out fear, and bringing love, trust, and confidence to the relationship. And next week, we're going to get into how to handle powerless people and what we what we do with powerless people and how to keep them from spilling their paint all over everything around us. Um, So if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes and pray for us. God, we thank you that you're the most powerful person in the universe, God. God, that you bring your love to us without any conditions. And that you ask the same from us, that we love you with all of our heart, God. And so we want to take the example that you've laid out for us, God, and we want to live that out. God, help us develop self-control. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to develop within us self-control so that we can have control of ourself so that we can relate to people in a way that's healthy. God, help us recognize the goats and the T-Rexes and the chocolate dragons in our life, God, and help us um, become aware of these tactics and, and what these people are doing in our life. God, help us bring our love to these situations, God, because we know that what's really behind those behaviors and those attitudes and those um, those just destructive patterns is really fear, and fear is the enemy of love. And so, God, we, we want to bring our love into every relationship that we can so it can drive out the fear, so that it can create healthy, um, strong relational connections with other people. And so, God, we just ask you to um, continue to work in us, continue to develop this in us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.